Jean-Pierre, we will see uh, what what uh, the the guy working in uh, in the OT uh, uh, do does really uh, in the patient and how uh, you can convince us to use uh, opioid free analgesia in uh, our patients. So we will follow with you uh, one of your patients, uh, a case report, and you will explain to you uh, how you did with this patient as uh, whole family management. Okay, first of all, I would like to thank the uh, French Society of Anesthesiology and Intensive Care to, uh, for inviting me to present a case report. Because I perform personally more than 900 patients under opioid free anesthesia, I have a problem to choose a case because I could present a short, so presen a short presentation, a short case, for example, for ambulatory surgery or long procedure or a very complex surgery or a very complex patient with many uh, comorbidities. So finally, I choose to present you uh, my own story. So I'm going for my own surgery. So with this slide, I would like to perform two remarks. The first is I'm going on foot in uh, the operative room, so we stopped any premedication. With so your now own bed, it's incredible. Yeah, <laughs> and then the second is because I have no premedication, I ask about my colleague to do the same things I usually perform for my patients. So one hour before my surgery, I'm going on his office and I perform a short talk about <laughs> the drug. How so do it? why? Because he have some experience, some expertise about opioid reduced anesthesia. So he used all the day lidocaine, ketamine, uh, dexamethasone, but he never, never before performed an opioid free anesthesia. So I perform a short talk for a yeah. few minutes in, in his office. And then we're going on my uh, medical record and to the beginning of the 2007, and I received so uh, opioid free uh, protocol. So you could see First of all, we use dexmedotomidine around 1.5 to 2 point microgram per kilo per hour, but we decrease the dose when you have uh, the onset of effect of uh, um, alpha-2 agonist. We use a lidocaine IV, so a bolus around 1.1 1, 1 milligram and continuous infusion. Same for the uh, ketamine around 0.5 mill milligram per kilo and a continuous infusion because it's a long procedure. If sometime I use epidural, of course, I use a very small amount of lidocaine and I'm running my epidural with rocpivacaine. And we do uh, dexamethasone also with around 1 point milligram per kilo. And then for the intubation, they use a muscle relaxation, of course. And my colleague is a little bit afraid with this protocol, so he uses a high dose of, uh, sure. of propofol. And then it's running Thanks. with uh, so gas. <laughs> so then when you look about the hemodynamic <laughs> profile, this is a usual hemodynamic profile when you use alpha-2 agonists. So about 30, 40 minutes, you have a slight decrease of cardiac frequency oh. and a slight decrease of arterial pressure. The interest of the hemodynamic stability previously discussed, if you want to increase the mean arterial pressure or the cardiac frequency, we could use atropine or you could use epinephrine or epinephrine. In my case, you use ephedrine, two, sm two small dose to increase the mean arterial pressure. The monitoring was only based on the bispectral index, but usually for my practice, I use any or null monitoring. Unfortunately for me, during the procedure, the surgeon need to move to the open surgery mm -hmm. for a bleeding problem. So you can see nothing in terms of bleeding problem in terms of hemodynamic. And now when I was awake in the PACU and I know that the surgeon moved to the open surgery, I was pretty sure that I received a small amount of opioid. But finally, my colleague don't give anything. Why? The first explanation is probably because I have no reaction at the incision surgical incisions, I have no tachycardia, no hypertension, the usual, uh, usual sign of nociception. Mm -hmm. So finally, is running for the procedure. Or maybe it's a retaliation for just uh, using a muscle relaxation because I have some problem with my colleague, but I'm not sure. So finally, is off our protocol. When you look about the end of the procedure, so usually, Oops, sorry. Oops, sorry, so where is that? So usually I'm just uh, running the lidocaine IV until the end of the PACU, but we stop the ketamine at the beginning of the closer 
And usually, in my practice, I stop a dexmedotomidine 30 to 40 minutes because it's an onset time for uh, VFX, so we could expect the same timing for the recovery. So usually I stop the dexmedotomidine here because there's not a good expertise about uh, dexmedotomidine. He prolongs the block, the v, uh, fusion of uh, alpha-2 agonists after the end of the closure because the closure with muscle relaxation have an extubation at this time in PACU with uh, just a multimodal approach with uh, uh, paracetamol and uh, nefopam. And for the PACU and for D1 and D2, I have only a pro a paracetamol and ketoprofen, and I don't use any opioid. I have a pill of morphine on my table, but I never use it because mm -hmm. I have control of my pain. So finally, in terms of conclusion, I would like, based on my own experience, I try to show you with this exa example and my clinical expertise, now I almost perform 100% of my procedure under opioid-free anesthesia, specifically for urology and abdominal surgery, but also for VNT surgery, for the thoracic surgery. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Jean-Pierre. So I have two, two things to say. First, I think that you, are, you were very courageous to, uh, to do that and to, uh, um, to, to show us uh, your own uh, surgery. Um, the second thing is that, is if I understood quite well, you arrived by foot at the, at the operating theater and uh, at that moment, the uh, mean arterial pressure and systolic arterial pressure were around uh, one, 160, something like that. So I think that... You are not fully non-anxious uh, <laughs> for me, so okay, whatever. So, so, so at the end, uh, you have a drop of pressure because at one moment you have a, a mean arterial pressure around uh, 55. So it's exact at that one moment, the dexmet and, and so on, and the uh, uh, the uh, vasoplegic uh, uh, um, uh, thing of the uh, of the anesthesia was quite important uh, in your case. But whatever, I think that uh, I it was very interesting for us to see that. And the third thing is that you say, I, do, I did not receive any uh, 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 painkillers, any, any pills of opiates okay. in the uh, past period. I think that probably they, they was a sort of, uh, um, okay, positive uh, Hawthorne effect because you are a believer of the uh, OFA. So uh, I think that at the end, uh, you crisp your teeth and you <laughs> say, okay, I don't <laughs> give uh, any opiates, please. So, uh, okay, but it, it, was, it was fully interesting, uh, really. Uh, thank you, Jean-Pierre, for that. So, uh, based on your experience of uh, almost 1,000 patients now, so you, 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 you say to us that you, you are able to use uh, OFA in every kind of patients, I would say. Um, so, one of my questions is to say, probably it is fully useful in the intraoperative period. I believe now, too, and I... I, um, I, I know that probably it is true. What about the uh, post-operative period? Because it is less clear about uh, the, the impact of the intraoperative use of no opiates at all and the fact that in the post-operative we don't use uh, uh, opiates or we use less opiates than if we use opiates in the intraoperative, you know? Uh, what is really the truth in, the, in this topic? I think that the very important thing is to have a personalized anesthesia, so we don't use the same protocol as previously said again, with the same dose of lidocaine, ketamine, and so. So after that, the second uh, remark is about hemodynamic during the surgery. So it's very important to know that every drug we use usually for increase the pressure or something like that is effective. So we can use epinephrine if we need. For example, if you perform a patectomy, we use a small amount of uh, norepinephrine in continuous infusion and without any problem to control hemodynamic. For the recovery and postoperative pain, clearly the rule is a patient must have no pain. So in our institution, patients have sometimes some titration in uh, PACU. Sometimes the pain was increased during the night, usually during the second part of the night. But at this time, patients have a very good cognitive function. So we stop to use a PCA IV morphine, and you use oral pill of morphine, mm -hmm. and you use a very small amount of morphine. But it doesn't matter. The patient must to have no pain. The problem with the opioid-free anesthesia is probably the very, very good cognitive function 
where they, when they are arrive in patio and in a floor. So after that, patients say, okay, I have a pain. Sometimes we, I discuss with the patient and say, I have a pain with, what's the level of pain? Five. Mm -hmm. I say, do you want a pill of morphine? No, no, it's a control. It's exactly the same for me. I have some pain after this surgery. Okay, I don't like to use morphine, but I would like to, I am pretty sure if I have a pain, I could use it because I have a pill of morphine on my table. And that it's because it's a reassuring problem, but sure. it's really true. So the rule is again, again, a very good control of pain. So cognitive function is a part of that. Anti-inflammatory of drug yeah, with sure. opioid free anesthesia, yeah. it's another part of that. Nice. Um, uh, bowel <coughs> transit is another part of that. And a patient with this protocol, we stop or reduce the number of epidural. Why? Because patient go on the floor. So he's, he's stay in in sitting in a bed at age 20, 25 hours after the, the surgery, patient was sitting on a bed. So we have no trouble yeah. about uh, yeah, well epidural. I, I understood, but uh, one of the problems for me, you know, is to say um, to, to colleagues, because we are anesthetists, right? And uh, we, uh, we go forward and we search every time the magic bullet, not using any kind of opiates in our patient. And uh, I, I'm a little bit afraid about the the thing that if we can expect, because we use no opiates in the intraoperative period, that now we have the solution of everything, not using any pill of opiates in the postoperative period. Yeah. For me, it's a little bit, you know, uh, I think we are clearly in the patient-centered care, right? Yeah. So we have to adapt our uh, um, management uh, of every kind of patient, because I think it will be very difficult to, to push all our colleagues uh, from the other part of the computer to say, now you have the solution, okay? Mm. I think it's, uh, it, it, it can yeah. be a little mm. bit difficult to know that, okay? Uh, one of the questions we have is, if everything is okay, intraoperatively, uh, uh, the colleagues say, I think that, okay, I can use uh, OFA. So it means I can use Dexmed, I can use beta blockers if I want to use it. I can use alpha-2 adrenergic agonist. Uh, I, I can use uh, magnesium sulfate. But if something wrong happens, so in other words, if I have uh, an hypertension, a bradycardia, etc., what I have to do? If something, for instance, an hemorrhagic shock happen or you know uh, something happen, do you have to move rapidly? Uh, to decrease the drug we use, or wha what you do in in, in practice? Uh, in practice, I have. Many times, uh, some trouble with eye dynamic problem, with bleeding problem. So, because the drug have a long acting half life, it's so that's why. a problem. Yeah. So, we, we, my my practice now, I move about uh, vent ventilatory control with uh, a gas. I reduce the amount of gas mm -hmm. because we don't need really to use a gas. So I reduce the gas. I and I use all the drugs we usually use. I like atropine, ephedrine, or noradrenaline. And because patients, for example, have no beta blockers, there is a good correction of this. So again, opioid-free anesthesia give a very good stability, but is not a protection about everything. It's not a magi magic bullet. We discuss about opioid-based anesthesia with uh, Tiva, Propofol, and Remifentanil. That also not a very good bullet, uh, magic bullet, because mm -hmm. Which we don't solve. So with this protocol, it's very complex. We need to personalize the patient. We don't discuss about the monitoring of the nociception. That's a very good problem because when you have a good monitoring of that, we could probably decrease the dose of lidocaine or maybe ketamine or alpha-2 agonists. But for the moment, you have nothing about enough information to m modulate uh, the anesthesia and probably to have a more safety margin for uh, using all this drug. Okay, uh, uh, another question and uh, a very rapid answer, please. Uh, um, there is, uh, um, what about the, uh, um, the new uh, recommendation that the societies can do? So uh, the question is, uh, how are new recommendation protocols about the use of ROFA going to be shared? Uh, so I think that for the moment it's a bit difficult to answer, but uh, if you have some, I some words. I think that a very important answer and very important guidelines that should be promoted is the use of multimodal uh, anesthesia, sure. multimodal analgesia. It's the most important component of ultimately OFA. And OFA can, with the combination of opioid sparing strategies, lead to the fertility of opioids. But it's the consequence. It's not per se a goal. Okay. Um, 
thank you very much, guys, for this uh, session because we have no uh, no more than one minute. So uh, I, I want only to see uh, some answers concerning my question about: uh, Do you want now to have uh, uh, an offer anesthesia if, uh, like uh, uh, Jean Pierre, you will be anesthetized by your own colleagues? And the question is now after this session, not, not before, but after this session is definitely yes. So hope that uh, we have uh, 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 convinced the majority of the colleagues that uh, um, uh, OFA, it's only no more than one thing more that we have in our portfolio to adapt uh, uh, how to use anesthesia management in, uh, in the patient. This is very important and that yes, we are able to do anesthesia without opiates and with a good safety and uh, this is possible and it is only i think the the very important word that we have to uh, to put on the table as a as a key parameter for uh, uh, pushing uh, our colleagues to understand that uh, not definitely uh, no definitely the ofa is not the magic bullet or everything but is one of the possibility to, uh, uh, to manage the patient with a high safety profile and to uh, uh, expect to limit the use, to spare uh, the use of opiates in the perioperative period. So thank you very much, uh, Patricia, Hélène, Patrice, and Jean-Pierre for this uh, very interactive and interesting session. Thank you.